Well, good morning, men, mighty men of God. We are here gathered for our PK Bible study. We've been working through the book of Daniel and um, I get my video to come on. But anyway, um, we are in sort of a chapter 11. I probably won't finish all of chapter 11 today. Uh, just because the way the study is set up, but um, it'll be the end of 11 and um, all 12 next week, uh, as long as we, uh, as long as the Holy Spirit takes us there, uh, we'll be good to go. Uh, would somebody like to pray us in this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to discern your word and to understand what you're trying to communicate to us each and every day. We thank you, dear Lord, for every blessing that you provide to us. We know that it's you that is helping us to get through each and every day, dear Lord, because we all have our own, our own struggles, dear Lord. But you help us to get past those struggles and to get to the next one <laughs> so that we can be challenged and be with you, dear Lord, and be amongst you. And, and you you help us, dear Lord, each and every day. So we pray that you will help us today understand your word and help us to know what you want us to understand. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Let's see if I'll switch my camera around here. Let me get started. There we go. Oh, sorry about that. It dropped me off. So. I had a little problem with mine th this morning also, but finally it let me in. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, as long as you guys can hear me, we'll go forward. I need to see my ugly face in there, right? All right, so not a lot posted in the in the um, app this week by me because uh, we were basically I posted them the week before for this particular chapter. Um, <clears throat> I know this is going to bug me being a technical guy. <laughs> I probably have to restart my computer, but. Um, We'll just go with no, 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 no. Anyway, so last week we we just we uh, in chapter ten, and we had um, we started talking about some political leader kind of issues uh, that that were were happening around that time around Daniel's location, I guess. Um, and we talked a lot about how being persistent in prayer, um, and you know, Daniel was in captivity at age 15. He's now about 85, been persistent in God's word and uh, in prayer, at least he's been in, in prayer. Uh, I would expect they had scrolls by then or some, something to, for him to go by, but I don't know that for sure. Um, and I think we were um, just kind of starting this uh, question number five, but I really I kind of want to start six, but I'll read number five in case there's anything anybody uh, has to bring up on this. Um, and let me get through this five, maybe six, and then we'll read chapter 11, um, two through 36. So somebody can be ready to read that, that'll be great. So uh, what does the unveiling of demonic activity, uh, specifically in, 10, 13, in chapter 10, 13, 
and in political affairs teach you about the world. And let me say, everything. So, um, the chapter 10 13 talks about the prince of the Persian kingdom who resisted God's messenger and probably refers to a powerful evil spirit who influenced the, the affairs of the Persian uh, government. What does this unveiling of demonic activity in political affairs teach you about? our world. Well, for me, it just says that, as I think as we've talked about here many times, uh, there's a spiritual realm beyond our physical world. And in that realm, there are evil forces and there are good forces. And the good forces uh, are the Holy Spirit, uh, God's Holy Spirit, God himself. And but uh, Satan is uh, sort of directing these evil things uh, as our enemy. And um, what this tells me is that that enemy, that spirit, can be in any of us, that evil spirit can be in any of us, uh, probably is in us a lot, a lot or most of the time until we drive it out, right? until we ask Jesus send your Holy Spirit to fill me or, uh, or show me your love, help me to be your salt and light in this world. And if political, um, if, if politicians forget that fact, even if they're brought up and they were um, you know, of God most of their life, they get caught up in this power right? The power of being in charge, power of having so many people looking after them or looking uh, up to them. And uh, it changes, it can definitely change a person, um, especially a person who's not as devout as Daniel is in seeking God. But um, so let's start with this question here. If an evil power could hinder an angel in, in Daniel's day, what does this indicate about our own need for help against Satan's forces? Well, I think first off, we need to understand that that war that's going on around us is the same war that's been going on ever since Daniel was having these visions. Uh, it hasn't stopped, and it's not going to stop until Jesus comes back and reconciles everything um you know we have so many good scriptures especially the one that us men really like to go to in ephesians chapter six where he's telling us to put on the armor of god because the, the wars that we fight are not of this war of this world they're they're not of flesh and blood but they're of powers and principalities and stuff that we don't understand um you know how i dive deep into these things uh when we look at uh what was going on in chapter 10 and um, we get a description of this person who came to talk with him. The description that was given there is very much like the description that was given of Christ in Revelation. This seemed to be um, an entity that was even more powerful than, um, than Gabriel when he came to visit Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, you know, and gave those visions and stuff. Um, people say well maybe this was an incarnate of jesus coming to to daniel right and then then the question comes up well if it was jesus then then why uh why would he having to fight people uh but if we look at our lives today we have the holy spirit residing in us uh, but we still we still choose not to let him produce the fruits a lot of times so when we're praying for things, if we if we're holding on to something, this this war is still raging, and it and it doesn't matter if it's the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter if it's an angel, it doesn't matter if it's Jesus, it doesn't matter if it's God. God is not going to stop certain things. If he if he did, he wouldn't be the God that he is. Um, so 
the question that you asked there, it's like this war is still going on, man. Uh, and we have to be prepared for it. Yeah, so without going back and reading it, uh, I think we read it a couple of times last week. Uh, so Daniel fasts for three days, mm -hmm. right? And during those three days, we find out later in the in this chapter that, or I don't know about this on that um, that this evil um, spirit had actually been held up, um, or or I'm sorry, the messenger had been held up by the evil spirits in this uh, in this king. Uh, so yeah, we have to. I was talking to somebody last well, on Thursday night about about um, when we were talking about love and fear and how how those what those mean and how they play out and love being you know the first in the list of the um, the fruit of the spirit and um, for the whole fruit of the spirit is God's character. Um, and we often say God is love, but um, and, and love is the first one of those listed. But um, you know, if we're not able to love others as we love ourselves, then you know, something's wrong in that balance of forces. I think. So, if we could get somebody to read, um, you can start in Daniel chapter uh, eleven. Uh, you can start in verse one. We did include verse one last week. So really, we're going to focus on two through thirty-five this week. Daniel eleven two through thirty-five. Before we start to read, I have a comment about your last statement. There, we're talking about God is love, and God and love being, you know, the first of the fruits of the spirit. Um, when when it comes to how that engages in us, we also have to think about that the last one that it mentions is self-control. And so those are bookends, love and self-control. Uh, if we don't have self-control to make the right decisions and do the right things, um, then, it, then it's hard for the love to be produced as well. Um, so... So we got this this whole thing here, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness, your gentleness. A lot of that comes down to your own self choices, right? Yeah. Amen. So I'll I'll be happy to read. How far you want us to read? Uh, through thirty five. Through thirty five. Okay. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I even I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he is risen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion, with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. Also the king of the south shall become strong, as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And at the end of some years they shall join forces, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement but she shall not retain the power of her authority and neither he nor his authority shall stand, but she shall be given up with those who brought her and with him who begot her and with him who strengthened her in those times. But from a branch of her roots, one shall arise in his place who shall come with an army, enter the fort fortress of the kingdom of the North and deal with them and prevail. And he shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Also, the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south and shall return to his own land. However, his sons shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. And he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. 
And the king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude. But the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. When he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up, and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come at the end some years with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times many shall rise up against the king of the south. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound and take a fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him, thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be for him. After this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many, but a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end, and with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. There shall arise in this place one who imposes taxes on glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. And in his place shall arise a vile person to whom they will give on, who they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a number, a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably, even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil, and riches, and shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall, be, south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacy shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Both these kings shall be, sent, be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table. But it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. At the appointed time, he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter, for ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there an abomination of desolation. Those who do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Sid 32, right? 35. 35. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Thank you, Brother Tom. So, um, so pretty pretty detailed, pretty complicated set of kings and battles and stuff. Um, let me sorry, let me get back to the question. So, based on your on our previous studies in Daniel. Um, can you Nick, are there names and events that you can match with 
those predictions that are being given here in 11 uh, verses 2 through 4. Verses 2 through 4. Yes, I tried to map out some of this, <laughs> as you guys can see, kind of see maybe. Um, the one thing that I found out is, is we know that from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, there's about a 400 year gap that there's there's no information coming from God there. Uh, but what I found out through this study is that this particular story is actually um, the battles and the, the things that are taking place that are inside of that 400 years. So we do actually have some information in that 400 years of darkness, if we just go back and look at this, because it doesn't necessarily mention them in here, but in this you have, we have Darius, which it does mention, but you have Xerxes, you have Alexander the Great, you have Laodicea, who was actually the woman that he was talking about sending to the North. Um, you have all these people, um Ptolemy, Antiochus, Epiphany. It's talking about all of those rulers. That were, person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. Enter Antiochus. Oh, sorry. I thought I could just show that while you were talking. It's all right. And, uh, there, there's actually a, in this sermon that um, was done by National Catholic Church. Is, uh, um, but they, um, this is all one. So I'm going to stop sharing. Right now. Sorry to interrupt you. I was trying to. I was trying to. Put the picture up of what we, what you were talking about that I found. Um, so go ahead. <laughs> no, it would be better to have actually someone who has it more mapped out because going through this, um, there's a lot of when you get to the Seleucid and the, the Ptolemy. Uh, kingdoms that are that are flip-flopping back and forth through there um when it's talking about uh there's darius and then there's three kings and and the fourth will be the greatest well that one was xerxes um and then you know you have alexander the great that took over the seleucid ptolemy it, it, yeah all those little eras that i had there were were me following someone else giving an explanation um uh on the Seleucid side, you had Antiochus. And so those kings names split flop back and forth down through the generations because you would have one Seleucid and you would have one Antiochus, like Antiochus II. The next one would be Seleucus II. So they kind of alternated. But on the other side of the Egyptian side, it was Ptolemy. And that would name went down with them. Ptolemy one, Ptolemy two, Ptolemy three. And then you get all the way down to Antiochus Epiphany who was the the one really nasty guy they're talking about here? Who was Antiochus the Fourth? So, so ho hopefully that's coming up on your screen, and yeah, just exactly how at what you were you were talking about. You you can you can probably talk about it, talk through it better than I can because I oh, watch the sermon. I didn't study the. We have. The kings of the south on the left hand side and the kings of the north on the right hand side and how they were sometimes trying to mingle, sometimes trying to like one of them uh forget I forget which I think maybe Antiochus the the third was the great. Oh no 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 so Antiochus the second Try to arrange marriage, um, but the king, the Ptolemy the second, was already married, so he had to divorce his wife to marry the the king's daughter, 
from the, the king of the north daughter so, which was like <laughs> yes that and that was Laodice. yeah i think and, and that was it bernice bernice and um she poisoned them all the king the, the new wife and the son so there was no heir left um, right i don't know how somebody became ptolemy the third though but they did and um maybe it was due to her um and well ptolemy the third was actually the one that killed laodice <laughs> okay uh Ptolemy II was going along the same time as Antiochus II. Um, and yes, Antiochus II married Laodice and then in the head Berenice. Laodice killed Berenice. And then Ptolemy III killed Laodice, uh, going to Seleucus II. Yeah, and then on down the line. <laughs> it's, it's really convoluted through there. So anyway, that's our attempt to match. <laughs> <laughs> and for a country boy that hated history when he was going through school, this has been pretty interesting. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so so when in uh, a lot of the other well in Daniel eleven twenty one through twenty four, somebody wants to read that or look that up. I'll, I'll read this question. So it describes in in Antiochus persecution of the people of Israel who had regathered in Palestine after the exile in Babylon. So summarize Antiochus' character and the methods of the operation of the verses after that, or in 5 through 35. So if somebody read 21 through 24, just as a reminder here for us. So 11, 21 through 24 is what you want? Yes. Okay. He will be succeeded by the contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people secure, feel secure and will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away. Sorry about the change the page, guy. Okay? It's swept away before him. Swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act de deceitfully and will only a few people, he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, they will invade them and will achieve what, near nether, what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth amongst his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. Did you want to include 25 or just 24? Just 24 is good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's this conflict between Persia and Greece. This is what's being described in two through four. Um, And then based on um, Daniel, the, 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 the majority of the scripture for today, 11, 5 through 35, is concerned with conflict between the two divisions of the Greek empire, the Syrian Seleucid family, the king of the north, and the Egyptian Ptolemies, the king of the south. The focus is on a man we have yet have met before, Antiochus Epiphanes. So in Daniel 21 through 24, 
uh, it describes his persecution of the people of Israel who had regathered in Palestine after the exile in Babylon. To summarize Antiochus' character and methods of operation from these verses. I think we did that, actually. Anybody have anything to add to that? All right, so now let's read, now I'll, I'll read um, 11, 25 through 28. In a large army, and with a large army, he will stir up his strength. He will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant, and he will take action against it and then return to his own country. So he's going to desecrate the Holy Covenant, which is the holy people of Israel, right? Um, so, oops. So in, in, when Antiochus invades Egypt the first time, I read these so many times. So he invades Egypt the first time with relative success. The second time he met some opposition and in his frustration, he vented anger on the Holy Covenant, the Jewish religion, which is explained in 29 through 31. And then what do you learn from 32 through 35 about why God allows genuine believers to suffer under the hand of a godless tyrant. So let's go back and read this again. So let's focus on 29 through 31 first. At the appointed, at the appointed time, he will invade the South again, but his time will, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And then 31, uh, uh, his, his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time, they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little, a little help and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified and made spotless until the end of time for it is still, for it will still come at the appointed time. So in this last, these last few verses that, stop this here. From hostage. <laughs> this is Antiochus Epiphanes, or as the Jewish people would nickname him, Antiochus Epimanes, a madman. We have encountered this guy before, and he is bad news. He is going to desecrate the 
Okay. It might be good to hear this talk about temple in Jerusalem. It, He's going to sacrifice a pig on the altar. He's going to raise an image of Zeus. Yeah. He's going to out. Am I still sharing this? I have to stop sharing. Outlaw so circumcision. Continue. Attack the Jewish people on the Sabbath. There we go. Don't we love technology? <laughs> well, this, these, these videos are a little more accurate. I thought I had it figured out. But anyway, um, so <clears throat> here's our, So what is Maybe somebody can help here. What is the what do they mean by desecrate the covenant? De desecrate the holy temple. Um, so, so for um sorry, I was on mute there. They sacrificed a pig in it. I mean yeah. <laughs> so that was the that was the daily that was the daily sacrifice, right? So uh, not, a, not a pig. Not a pig. I mean, yeah. pig was an unclean. A pig was an unclean animal. They had to do doves. And oh, that, yeah, that was the desecration. That was a yeah. desecration of the pig. Yeah, the desecration was the pig. <laughs> yeah, um, but this, so they basically ruined the daily sacrifice. Um, they probably um, you know, killed the people who were praying. So. So it was we talked about last week in, or in chapter 10, you know, the, the, the prayer, the consistent prayer of Daniel uh, was what uh, was just as important as the daily evening sacrifice. But what do we what do we learn from this last bit about in, in verses 32 through 35 about why God allows genuine believers to suffer under the hand of a godless tyrant? I think verse 35 actually gives us the answer, I believe. It says, some of those understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Yeah, we're, so, we're always, so, always so talking we're, about finer's fire, right? Yeah, I think so. So... So somewhere in here between like 31 and 35, it, it goes from a, a prophecy that Daniel can foresee to far, far farther in the future, talking about the end time, basically what we know today as what happens in Revelation, the book of Revelation. Mm. Um, and that... Uh, um, this is, I believe I've heard it said that this is pointing to not Daniel's time, but a future time, the appointed time when Jesus returns. Does that make sense? Am I wacky? No wacky. Right. Well, it, well, if we look at the different visions that have already been presented to us, when we look at the statue that had a golden head and a, uh, a silver breastplate and the, you know, what we're looking at right now is basically the time of the silver breastplate. This is between, um, this is the media Persian and the Greece combats basically. Um, so we've, we've already seen this part of history and, and, and if we go by those things, we know that right after this is going to come the Roman Empire. So, yeah, uh, a lot of people use many of the verses in Daniel to talk about the end time. Um, some of the verses may pertain to it, but some of them may not. Some of them may just be, um, they, they may fall into a category that, that can be used for that. Um, 
which folks do a lot of times is use a verse and try to apply it to something else. So this is a very difficult um, book to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think the, the reason the Holy Spirit led me to this was because it is difficult, but it is also a great example of how we should be um, imitating Christ. Yes. Daniel was an imitation of Jesus Christ. And so it's a good example of his character versus all the things and crazy things that go, around, go on around him. He stays steadfast. Um, and uh, so so in, in up through, I think we said seven through well, seven through ten, chapter seven through ten, Daniel was prophesying about the future, right? And so in chapter eleven, this is still future to Daniel. Right. Yes, yes. However, yeah, this whole, yeah. This was this Daniel's whole... visions were several hundred years before these events took place, in such that people say that this had to have been written after the fact that Daniel couldn't have written this because he couldn't have gotten the details so specific. Yeah. So what I'm what I was was so. 11 through 35, we'll deal with today, are passed to us, right? They're, they're our, in our past. They're in our history books, right? Yes. Almost all of them. Uh, I think there was, a, I think uh, Pastor Heather uh, explained that there was a third, uh, a third battle of the, between the kings of the north and the south that were not in the history books. That part might be still in the future, even for us. But for most, for the most part, this is passed to us. So looking back, we can see how precisely God's plans did come true. So he is really in control. And I think that's been, you know, all the way through the, the um, uh, being thrown in the, in the, 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 the fire, and being thrown in the uh, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace, and Daniel being thrown in the lion's den. Um, God was in control. God was is in control in Daniel's future, which is now our a lot of it is our past, but he's still in control today, and he still will be in control for all of eternity. That's the hope of the world that I love to hear about and tell people about, right? So God is really in control. How could God's absolute authority and rule over history help us to understand, uh, help us to stand firm when evil seems to triumph? How do we stand firm in today's world where evil and chaos seem to be uh, all around us. Only by focusing on the word of God, that's for sure. Yeah, for me, as I pray quite often, I thank you, God, for being on your throne and in control. Because that gives me hope. I can I can drive through or even walk through the the worst parts of the city of Baltimore, New York City, Washington, D.C. There's good parts to all of those places, but there's also parts where you go block the wrong way and you're in, uh, you're on a shooting range, basically, uh, in some of these big cities. Um, but how do you stand firm? You know, I can remember a time. I don't know, it's been a while since I've told this one if I've told it, but I can remember a time when I was first in ministry, men's ministry, and then we were in Dayton, Ohio, and there's a there's a river and railroad tracks um, sort of on the 
west side of Dayton. And if you go over that, that those railroad tracks to the west side of Dayton, um, that's known been that's known where the uh, the shootings mostly happened at the time. It was 20, 30 years ago. Um, and that was, the, that was a bad part of town. And it was also, um, you know, very, uh, people of a very different color than me. But I would venture over there knowing that God had, had me, uh, he know that, that he was in control. And I had, I formed some great relationships with uh, pastors and some of their um, congregants over there that you know, I can remember being in, in one of their um, their homes um, back then and, and this, this pastor was kind of leading a Bible study and it wasn't one that I regularly went to I just went to and he said you know sometimes we make the Bible way too complicated this book he held up this book this book can be summarized in one word, love. And I, that has just stuck with me. And so you never know where you're going to be, where God's going to show up. He's going to be, he's, he's always going to be there. He's going to show up and he's going to be in control. And he's going to give you things that, um, uh, uh, Tim says things are cutting out and, and squeaking hopefully that's not just me Tim but uh, what do you guys think about how do you stand firm uh, when evil seems to be trying to uh, it's not triumphant it's triumph Mike Tim Rick anybody down there that's like me without a picture Well, I think I told you guys last week, if not, I'll, I'll tell you now, because I told a number of groups, and it just helps for me to just to, to say th say these things. But um, these, since my son's grand, or my grandson's uh, birth, uh, and how he was born, the trauma of his birth, uh, and the fact that I lost it that day, I, I could not handle life uh, very well that day. And um, I certainly wasn't, I wanted to be strong for my family, but something happened along the way. I'm still not quite sure exactly what it was, but it set me off. And, and I was, I, there was no way that I could be a good Christian in my home. So I left and um, went somewhere and started, just went to a parking lot, <laughs> um, about 20 miles from my home. And, and I just, I just started praying, God, I, you know, get me through this. I don't know what's going on. You know, um, help this little baby to survive. And now he's, you know, not because of that prayer, but because of God, he is a miracle. And he is um, driving a very happy um, little boy. Uh, we still get to watch him on video. But then, um, you know, my daughter's graduation, something happened the day before my daughter's graduation. Now, these are supposed to be some of the happiest times in your life, right? Uh, and, and something set me off again, and I was like, uh, I guess I'm just not needed in this family because everybody else knows everything more better than I do. I try to bring up, you know, what I think and just get shot down. And, and again, I just had to leave. And that night, I actually slept in a Walmart parking lot in my car, um, praying to God, fell asleep, woke up the next morning, and um, still kind of angry, but knew that it's graduation day and I had to pull it together. And I just asked God, you know, pull me together. <laughs> So uh, he did, and you know, we had a, a great graduation. And then the move out day, which is just two or three days later, again, um, 
you know, just what I call, you know, I wasn't like throwing things. I wasn't, you know, being bad. It was just like the thoughts that were going through my head could not come out my mouth. And when I did open my mouth, it was being taken as negativity or, you know, just certainly my anxiousness of getting this move done and things that I think about now, you know, my daughter is now every day less and less dependent on us. Uh, our baby, right? And then this week, she had her surgery. Um, the, what they thought was a golf ball size lump turned out to be a baseball size lump. And um, they got it out. The doctor feels like it looked like it was benign, but obviously we're going to do the pathology on it. Um, but the surgery was only supposed to take about an hour. And an hour was coming up, and I was getting anxious. Why isn't she in the recovery room yet? Because that's the only indication that we have of this, this board of sort of status. The hour and 15 comes up, and I'm just like, you know, most of the time I've been pacing the hospital anyway, right? Just trying to pass the time, trying to keep my mind off of that. And, and to, um, in my head, in my heart, stay close to God and not let anybody interfere with that. And finally, I just, in about an hour and 20 minutes or so, went and sat down by my wife to make sure she was okay. And I just put my head back and closed my eyes and prayed to God that all was good. Well, all was good, um, but there, you know, there was just more work to be done than the doctor had expected. So you know, God is good. God is in control. Sometimes we just got to let go and let him do his thing because it's going to turn out better than we can even imagine. Um, and so that's my story of, of how I see you know, the evil forces trying to get in my head change my heart and all I all I know to do is to go to God and, and I just and it just makes me think I just wish I, I wish I could show that to other people that that aren't Christians I mean you guys here are Christians you would understand that you may not do it all the time just like I don't do it all the time but you try to you know to and if you think about it for two seconds you will ask god to just fill your heart with his love his joy and his peace right the fruit of the spirit all those things make up the character of god fill me lord with the, with your character so that it drives out the demons the, the evil forces the, the evil thoughts that i'm thinking or the bad thoughts that i'm thinking of what could happen i, I think i told you guys i I, I, I tried to have a talk with my daughter a few months ago before the biopsy was even done. Um, letting, I wanted to let her know that God's got you, right? Even if it's cancerous, we're going to deal with it. He's going to help us deal with it. And whatever I said led her down the path of, of, of um, In a way, it's true, but it uh, led her down the path of, um, I'm going to die. And and that was certainly not dad's intention. Dad's intention was that um, we're going to do everything that we can, and we're, we're going to continue to pray to God that um, all is good with you, because you have a mission. Um, and so we got to talk about that later, but anyway, she um, turns out right before she was put under for the surgery, she was like, was scared. And the doctor could tell it, and the doctor just, Olivia remembers the doctor just put her hand on it and <clears throat> said, it's, it's all gonna be okay. Daughter wakes up, she's in a panic, calls for her mom, and her mom gets to go back with her recovery which you don't normally get to go into the first stage of recovery but um that's what she was thinking about 
watch the whole mm. watch watch our words um because like people take them as if they're of us um i think not necessarily of god and if they are meant to be of god or maybe they don't come out the right way so um anyway I'm thankful that God is in control and that my, that my daughter is upstairs recovering um, third day and each day's going better. So just a lot of pain, but we know that you know, that, that invasive um, mass is not there to hopefully bother her any longer. So thankful that we had such good care for and that God is just all over it in control, like I said. All right, sorry we're uh, over time here, but uh, I'm going to make sure that James, I, I tried to pause and let somebody else take, take so I didn't have to tell my story. <laughs> it's uh, it's painful, to, painful to tell, um, but it's also helpful and therapeutic. Uh, the best. Knowing that you guys, that you guys uh, have my back and understand, I think you understand. Hopefully, you understand where I'm coming from. If we can't do that, there's no reason to have this forum. Hmm. Thank you guys. That's for sure. Um. So last week we had a little bit of homework to write down some names of some politicians to pray for. I hope you did that. Um, I'm not going to hold you accountable to doing that. Um, I will say I paid for uh, a number of them across the spectrum, uh, local to, to national. Uh, um, let's just, let's just um, take our thoughts and our, our hearts to God and um, to ask for him to rule not only in those politicians' decisions, but our own decisions, so that he prevails. The last week it was to, to um, ask God to rule and overrule in their decisions, the polit political authorities' decisions, so that good and justice prevail. Uh, um, but we, if somewhere you'd like to pray, and I'd like to kind of change that for this week, for just to know that God is in control to let him rule and, and overrule our own decisions so that he can prevail because he is just and he is um, all those all those things that make up the thing of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. I know I left one out. I don't want to always leave one out. Goodness, kindness, patience. Yeah, I should just read them. Uh, I'll let you guys, uh, if anybody would like to pray, uh, please let's go to the Lord in prayer now. I'll close this. James, are you asking for prayer for yes. yeah. the end of this guys, session? If you guys feel, if the Holy Spirit's leading you to pray, please pray for us and I'll close us. Dear Heavenly Father, we always come before your throne humbly on our knees asking for forgiveness. And you always provided, dear Lord, as long as we truly repent. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give us on each one of these sessions where we can learn about what your word really means. Sometimes it's very difficult, dear Lord, because sometimes it doesn't make things seem like they, they really mean what we want them to mean. But we have to 
try and dis discern what you want us to learn, dear Lord. And so help us to understand that the, that the book of Daniel is, is very difficult, dear Lord, that we have to look into it and then ask for your, for your wonder and, and for your understanding, dear Lord, of what this all means. And dear Heavenly Father, sometimes that is difficult. But we know that your word is always, always a blessing, dear Lord, and that we will always try to discern exactly what you want us to get from this and to understand more about what you want us to understand in this world, dear Lord. This world right now is very dark, dear Lord. It's very, very dis discouraging and it's very upside down, much like the, the book of Daniel is, that it, it tries to give us an understanding and yet we know that the understanding is truly from you, dear Lord. It's your Lord. It's your word. It's your it's your guidance that we need, dear Lord, because right now our world is so dark. It's very dark, much like it was in the day of Daniel. So help us, dear Lord, to understand your word, to know that you are in control, to know that you are the, the world. You, you control everything that's going on in this world, dear Lord, and yet it seems very strange. And so Help us, dear Lord, to understand that you are the God of, of, of guidance. You're the God of control. You, you are in control, dear Lord, and we know this. So help us to understand exactly what you want us to do today, to understand what you, your, your guidance is for us, dear Lord, and help us to understand these words, and help us to understand these times, and help us to know that you are still in control, dear Lord. You're a God of control. You're a God of, of having things in a, a godly way. And so we know that you are still here, dear Lord. You're still protecting, and you will still guide us. And we pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen, amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Abba, Father. You are the Holy God. You are our Lord God Almighty. And Lord, you are always in control, no matter what the twists and turns, uh, evil spirits, or our own desires or designs may take us down a path. You still have a path for us, and you will keep us on that path as long as we. Decide that we're going to follow you. You will lead us down that path. We may not have a pillar of fire or cloud, but we have your Holy Spirit. And we just ask, Lord, that you send it in and amongst each of us that, that, that your Holy Spirit lives in us. Yes, Lord. So deeply, so greatly that it just banishes all evil spirits, all evil thoughts. And Lord, when those start to creep in, we know we're not as close to you as we should be. And Lord, we just ask that you would bring us back closer to you. Hold us in your arms and just show us your character, which you explain to us as the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. Thank you, Jesus. Things cannot go wrong when we are bearing the fruit of your character. So, Lord, thank you for the trials and the tribulations that we go through. Lord, we thank you that you're always there when we uh, when we turn to you. And, Lord, help us just to turn to you each and every day more and more so that we are in your spirit. We are of your character all throughout our day. And, Lord, we thank you for... Um, your direction, your future, your promise 
the promise that you're going to give us uh, the eternal life that you promised to us. So, Lord, continue to guide us into this next week. Show us your favor. Direct our paths. And, Lord, we just thank you for continuing to love us no matter the circumstance. So we ask all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Um, go forth and be the church this week. Amen. Um, have a great week. Love you guys. Uh, and we will see you. Hopefully I will see you next week. Or I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> if my camera works, you'll see me next week. Hopefully, we can see you next week. <laughs> God bless. God bless you guys. Have a good week. Thank Love you guys. God bless you.